Rob, thank you for an amazing uh, introduction. And let me just assure everybody that in these last 10 years, uh, Mez and Old Salem have had no finer friend and partner than Rob Hunter and everything he's done through Ceramics in America and with the Art and Clay Project. And it's a great pleasure for us to be able to call you colleague and friend, and we really do really mean that. Um, so my talk is going to be on 50 years of collecting Southern ceramics, Mesda and the Mariner Collection. Now, the reason is we're really going to be sort of celebrating uh, two great marriages. Uh, last year, we had the ability to celebrate Mesda's 50th anniversary. It's hard to believe that in 1965, uh, Frank Horton and his mother, Theo Tolliver, had the vision of transforming a Kroger grocery store into the museum that we all got to tour and explore and appreciate uh, today with all of its wonderful galleries. In terms of ceramics, that was an obvious uh, connection because as you can see here with this wonderful slip decorated dish by Gottfried Aust, who was the master potter, here in Salem and after Johanna's powerful presentation on the stoves, the ceramics tradition right here in Salem was so strong that it made the formation of a museum that would be dedicated to Southern ceramic traditions really unnatural. And if you go and look at the early photographs of Mesda and the period room installations at the time, if you dig through the details you can actually see that ceramics were an important part of those installations from the big, very beginning. Although today, as curators, we're a little horrified when we go, was that really on the floor? <laughs> but Frank Horton had gone out and acquired so much of the best of the best and the ability to have the monumental dish by Peter Bell and the lion by his son Solomon that was given to as a gift to Solomon's niece. To have the uh, uh, edge field represented with the works of the Phoenix factory and already from the beginning, even before Luke Zip, let's see, in 1965, Luke, you would have been even born? <laughs> even before Luke Zip would take on his study of the incise decorated uh, Baltimore stonewares and of course, um, um, Winchester, as we like to call Solomon Bell's lion, in many ways really did become Mesda's mascot. Uh, he, we've even produced him as a soft stuffed animal that we used to sell in our store. So we um, all think of uh, Winchester as Mesda's special friend. And earlier uh, uh, yesterday, we all got to applaud and welcome to this conference Brad Rauschenberg. And what can you say? I mean, Brad was the person who, through the vehicle of the Mesda Journal, um, not only brought objects to the Mesda collection, but published them, such as the whole career of Andrew Duche in Georgia. And it was really right at the time that he was publishing Duche's uh, career in South Carolina and Georgia in the 1730s that this jar suddenly turned up with the AD mark on the top left a uh, very close replica of, uh, of Duchesne's father's mark in Philadelphia. Um, uh, and this uh, appeared in northern Florida, just below the Georgia state line. Brad was the person who pioneered the work on Benjamin Duvall, the Richmond uh, stoneware potter, and was able to bring into the collection this pivotal early example of Duvall's Mark Stoneware, and the Mesda Journal really became a great vehicle, this is before ceramics in America, for publishing important new scholarship on Southern ceramics. So things like Charlie Umstadt's work on Henry Lowndes, the Petersburg Stoneware Potter, um, you know, that represented another phase of Mesda's publications in its journal and the ability to add pivotal uh, objects to the collection <clears throat> to represent that scholarship. Now, not everything that came into the collection that represented the best of Southern ceramics, in many cases, has had the same level of scholarly attention. And I think that's one of the fun challenges for the future. When we were in the gallery this morning, uh, at one point we got to talk about the role of women potters in the early South and how lucky are we to have 
this very simple earthenware crock, but when you turn it over, it's signed by Mary Adam. It's the earliest known example of southern ceramics signed by a female potter of around 1820 in Hagerstown, Maryland, but something that really illuminates the daughter of a potter who became the wife of a potter and then the widow of a potter and continued that potting tradition within the family. And Angelica Kettner was able to really enlighten us on an object that had been in the Mesda collection for 40 years and the life and career of David Jarbor as a free black potter in Alexandria. And I think we're all really looking forward to not only having appreciated Angelica's lecture, but hopefully seeing it turned into its own article in the Mesda Journal um, at some point in the near future. So Frank was able to, with Brad's help, put together a tremendous foundation for Southern pottery uh, uh, collecting and scholarship and studies here at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. But over the course of the last 10 years, we did realize that there were some significant holes. So we've been able to work on building the collection of Piedmont, North Carolina pottery with things like this monumental jar by Chester Webster of Randolph County, North Carolina. Such an important potter who was born in Connecticut, part of an important Hartford, Connecticut potting tradition came to North Carolina, first to my hometown of Fayetteville, and then later moving to Randolph County, where his pictorially uh, um, um, uh, incised works are so monumental, so important, and the ability to get this example with its great bird with the banner in the year 1850 coming out of its mouth. <clears throat> but we knew we needed to geographically broaden our scope and to reach out to the potters of East Tennessee and the Kane family and the ability to acquire from uh, the man who had been such an important collector of that material early on and scholar of that material, Roddy Moore, this um, uh, monumental jug that also came right out of the Kane family of potters. It had been passed down from male to male to male within the Kane family and really represented their important work of producing all this wonderful uh, uh, manganese splotch decorated ware in Sullivan County, Tennessee. I know Dick Clay will appreciate the story that, you know, until you've gone to a John Case auction in Knoxville and gone head to head with Sharon and Matt Cox uh, in bidding on a Kentucky object, um, you've never really sweated bullets. <laughs> but it was our ability to then bring back from that auction this monumental churn that you uh, saw with Brenda's lecture, uh, uh, stamped I. Thomas, Kentucky. Uh, 1836, a monumental, phenomenal thing. And of course, it was sort of funny that uh, <clears throat> it was after Mesda acquired this and a, and a record price had been set that, I think it was the Lexington, Kentucky newspaper, actually ran an article about this sale with a headline, um, Old Churn Makes Lots of Bread. <laughs> And as we now recognize after Dr. Hoare's lecture that you know, you, we can't ignore the African-American component to early Southern ceramic studies. And so it was about eight years ago that Mesda was able to acquire its first example of the face vessel tradition. And I think after Dr. Hoare's lecture, we're all really excited about the future of this particular avenue of Southern ceramic scholarship and what we're going to learn about this over the next several years. Well, Art and Clay was a monumental project that we undertook several years ago in partnership with the Chipstone Foundation, with other uh, financially supporting foundations. It was a traveling exhibition that um, 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 went to Colonial Williamsburg and to Milwaukee and to Huntsville, Alabama and to the North Carolina Museum of History in Raleigh. Really a, a, a groundbreaking thing for us in telling the larger story of masterworks of North Carolina earthenware and breaking down the traditions as we had previously understood stood them and realizing that a dish like this was not the work of Rudolph Christ as our good friend John Bivens had published in his book on the Moravian Potters of North Carolina. Christ never did go rogue and try to tear down the Gottfried Aust 
floral tradition, but rather continued that. And where he did become innovative, it was more in the press molded bottles. And that this represented a completely different group. Uh, 40 or so miles east of here, a group of German potters in the Albright and Loy families uh, working in present day Alamance County, North Carolina. Now, the Art and Clay Project not only brought forward new scholarship, and it not only provided the opportunity for Rob Hunter and Johanna Brown and Luke Beckerdite to collaborate and produce a, a powerful exhibit and two back-to-back -back issues of Ceramics in America, but it also brought to the table um, the loan of this wonderful Alamance County slip-decorated runlet that belong to two people that no one at Mesda or Old Salem had ever met before. And it allowed us to understand that in 1965, when Frank Horton and Theo Tolliver were busy founding Mesda, another incredibly important event in Mesda's history was happening that they didn't even know about. And that was that in 1965, at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Berlin, in Berlin, Maryland, <laughs> a young man named William C. Mariner uh, was able to uh, uh, convince a beautiful young woman, Susan Savage, to become his bride and to begin a fabulous 50 plus year partnership of collecting Southern ceramics. And while Winchester, the lion, was sort of the, the logo of Mezda ceramic collecting. Susan and Bill love to tell the story how it's this pot with the incised ship decoration that has been sort of the logo for them um, uh, in a very sort of uh, obvious tongue in cheek way. And that as Susan says, if your last name is Mariner, what, uh, what, 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 what better object? But over the last several decades, they've been able to consult with the best, work with the best, collect the best, and nobody has led that effort more than Rob Hunter, who at the same time that he was uh, 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 assembling scholarship from across the country in these ongoing publications of ceramics in America, could guide Susan and Bill on putting together a fantastic collection. And they still love to tell the stories about the early days when they could go to Rob's shop in Yorktown, Virginia, and sort of walk in the door and ask Rob, so what have you got? And Rob would sort of go through pot after pot and sort of advise them on what were the kinds of things that, that would be uh, important in putting together a truly amazing collection. Things like what we've gotten to see and appreciate uh, yesterday and today. You know, what could be more important than this jar that uh, as, 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 as Rob likes to say in lectures, you know, if a pot is going to tell you, you know, who made it, where was it made, when was it made, you get to sort of have the fun play on, well, was this made in Yorktown in 1781? No. It commemorates the events of Yorktown in 1781 and was actually made in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, to celebrate the tour of the Marquis de Lafayette. And, uh, um, and the national celebration of American independence. But Susan and Bill have embraced the power and the beauty of Southern pottery and the ability to tell complex stories like the jar by <clears throat> uh, John P. Shermerhorn of Richmond with its political uh, message of the profile of uh, General Andrew Jackson and the soldier holding the sword. They've been able to embrace the aesthetic qualities of great, powerful southern ceramics and contrast, things like the cobalt bird decoration on a great piece of Baltimore in size decorated uh, um, pitcher or on the work of John P. Shermerhorn coming out of Richmond. And then maybe one of their you know, favorite things, the David Greenland Thompson jar from Morgantown, West Virginia, part of that important tradition of people pots coming out of that particular region. And this being, is this still the only one with the, with the David G. Thompson mark? In, yeah, in Morgantown. in Morgantown. So it's so, it's so monumental. And the great thing about watching Susan and Bill collect 
is that you get to see this passion that says, well, you know, if you're going to have a Morgantown pot with one lady, then don't you want one with two? And if you're going to have a Morgantown pot with two ladies, then don't you have, want one with three? And then don't you want to have the pots with the one and the two and the three ladies all together just to enjoy it? And if you have to cross the Mason-Dixon line to get an entire marching um, uh, militia regiment, then why not do that as well? But what a powerful story, as we said in the Mariner Gallery today, the ability to enjoy and appreciate this assemblage of material now shared with the public in such a, such a special way of a, of a family of Southern potters who move right on the Mason-Dixon line. And when the Civil War begins, some cousins are below the line and some cousins are above. And they happen to live in the part of Virginia that when Virginia secedes from the Union, they secede from Virginia in order to remain with the Union. And so, you know, it really is the ability of taking the, this pottery and telling far more complex social and historical issues that, that makes the Mariner Collection such a joy for curators and scholars and students to study and interpret and over the, over the next several generations, I think, do more and more to publish. Jeff Evans can certainly tell his own fun story about what it was like to uh, have a very exciting auction with Susan and Bill in the audience. And when Bill was very uh, uh, bravely willing to sort of set a new record on Shenandoah Valley stoneware with the acquisition of this great uh, uh, small honeypot by Emmanuel Souter, the important Mennonite potter uh, working in Rockingham County, Virginia in the mid-19th century, this being one of only three known examples that have that stencil decoration with his name that seems to have been part of his work right around 1850. And so when you've got a collector like Bill and who's got this jar and the stencil itself comes up at auction, well, what are you going to do? Well, there's only one thing you're going to do. You're going to go to that auction and you're going to buy it. Because these things have to be together. I mean, history demands that these things have to be together. And so over the last few years, Susan and Bill have been willing to travel to Tennessee to buy the very best of Tennessee stoneware, this William R. Craven uh, water cooler from Henderson County, Tennessee, in western Tennessee, uh, with its wonderful multiple handle form and the uh, 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 double crimp joints, but representing the role of that impo all-important Craven family of North Carolina potters who branch out and go everywhere, to Georgia, to Tennessee, to Texas, to Missouri. And if you have any questions about who made this or where they made it or when they made it, all you have to do is read W.R. Craven's you know, own inscription with his uh, picture of the owl and the year 1847. And writing there, I don't know why he felt that he needed to write this to a West Tennessee audience, but warranted to be stoneware, just in case there was any doubt. And Bill and Susan felt that if it was important to acquire a great African-American made face vessel um, um, to have next to Mezda's in, the, in their gallery, then it was important to go ahead and make it a set of four. Um, so that these things could be studied and compared and contrasted and really add in an important way to the ongoing scholarship in that particular area of Southern ceramics. And it hasn't stopped there. Lucius Jordan was a Georgia potter working in Washington County, Georgia. They were recently able to acquire this wonderful signed example of his work, uh, this uh, very elaborate ruffled flower pot. And um, new research shows that uh, Lucius Jordan is also one of these complex racial stories. If you go to the 1850 census, he and his wife and his children are listed as white. But go to earlier Georgia tax records and find him and his brother in 1837 and 1838. It wasn't a one-time annual mistake. They're listed as freemen of color. So we're probably looking at the work of, of a mixed-race family using pottery as a way of surviving because they never owned much land. 
Um, so, uh, so, so rather than being farmers or planters, you know, potting was the way they were able to um, express themselves. So in terms of the, uh, the range of the racial component of early Southern pottery, we can now, I think, add Lucius Jordan and his family to that, to that complexity. While stoneware has been uh, the Mariners' great love, cobalt-decorated stoneware in particular, they weren't going to ignore earthenware. So if they needed to drive all the way to Winchester, Virginia, to have a meaningful conversation about how the Shenandoah Valley's earthenware traditions and its Germanic earthenware traditions could be incorporated into the gallery, gosh darn it, they were willing to do that and bring back objects like this <clears throat> Peter Bell bowl probably made during his Winchester period and having some of the same Germanic motifs that we can compare and contrast to the things being made by the German potters in Alamance County, North Carolina. Or to go back to a Jeff Evans auction and realize that this was one of the best Hagerstown bowls that anybody had seen in years and the ability to make sure that it could be brought into the Mariner Gallery. Or to go, once again, to go all the way to Tennessee and realize that Christopher A. Hahn and his unionist story and the quality of his work as a potter was another critically important element to be represented in the Mariner Gallery. And so to acquire this wonderful uh, ring bottle at the, at, the, at the very same auction where I had, had to go head to head with uh, Sharon and Matt Cox on the Kentucky churn, uh, Bill was much more successful. So we've come a long way from those early days when Mesda already had a great collection of southern ceramics, thanks to Frank Horton, um, and displayed throughout the rooms, to where now we have the William C. and the Susan S. Mariner Southern Ceramics Gallery. And I think it's appropriate that when you first walk into that gallery, you immediately encounter the Salem-made desk and bookcase that was made by Salem master joiner <clears throat> Johannes Krauss for Salem's master potter, Rudolf Christ. And inside that desk and bookcase is a wonderful assemblage of Rudolf Christ's press-molded uh, animal forms in a way that emphasizes this was and is and always will be an important center for Southern ceramic studies. And the ability to then build on that and look at the other Piedmont, North Carolina traditions among the various German and Quaker potters uh, working in North Carolina. But then all you have to do is turn around and it's just a tour de force of all the major Southern traditions moving geographically all the way around the gallery from earthenware to stoneware, from Piedmont, North Carolina, to the Shenandoah Valley, to Baltimore, to Alexandria, to Richmond, to Morgantown, to Tennessee, to Kentucky, back to Piedmont, North Carolina, and then into the wonderful world of the Alkaline Glaze tradition, both in Edgefield and in the Catawba River Valley. And the ability to also sort of um, put pots together in a way that makes them more thematic and the ability to look at the various ceramic traditions represented by the important families, such as the Adams with Mary Adams Crock and Peter Bell and the Bell family with that Peter Bell monumental dish, or to explore issues of design and expression in early Southern pottery. And in many ways, I think, you know, when the gallery was being opened and completed, nobody could say it better than Susan herself who made the comment, as you can see here, this gallery gives Bill and me joy in sharing with the public the objects that have enriched our lives for so many years. Each object tells a unique story, and we now realize that acquiring them was only the first step. I think we should all give Susan and Bill Mariner a great round of applause. And now I'm happy to share with you an announcement. We think this conference has been such a success 
the quality of the scholarship, the presentations, the tours, that a group of us got together today to form a working group and to make the decision that this MESDA conference is actually going to be the springboard for a brand new series of Southern Ceramic Conferences that will be biennial every other year, jointly sponsored by MESDA and Colonial Williamsburg, and that the next Southern Ceramics Conference will convene in Williamsburg in March of 2018. We ask you to go ahead and block that period of time on your calendars and as more details begin to emerge in 2020, the conference will come back here because we think this is too great a thing. And we think that what Susan and Bill have created with objects and scholars and students and dialogue uh, needs to continue. So the, the, the launch of the Southern Ceramics Conference is something that we're proud of and I think we can all be proud of because it was the dynamism of these two days that created that conversation. So what we're beginning, you've all been a part of. And thank you very much.